talk a little about mm -hmm. the crucifixion this morning mm -hmm. um, before we get into prayer. I'll leave that up there for you. Okay, I'm going to just, uh, the encyclopedia has something to say about crucifixion. It's called Execution of a Criminal by Nailing or Binding to a Cross. It was a common form of capital punishment from the 6th century BC to the 4th century AD, especially among the Persians, the Egyptians, Carthaginians, and the Romans. You'll remember that Roman soldiers crucify our Lord. Um, the Romans used crucifixion for, um, for slaves and for criminals, but never for their own citizens. Roman law provided that the criminal be scourged before being put to death. The definition of scourging from the death dictionary is number one, a whip for inflicting pain, suffering, or punishment. Any, number two, any instrumentality or means for causing suffering or death. Three, severe punishment. Four, act of scourging is a whip severely, to whip severely or to flog um, or to punish severely. And it was usually I, a whip was like a I had a handle on it, a couple of feet and all these three um, tentacles made out of leather, and on the tips of those tentacles there was either glass or metal or, or some hard substance for inflicting lots of pain and, and, and suffering and, and cuts. The accused also had to carry either the entire cross or more commonly the cross beam from the place of scourging to the place where they were to be crucified. The practice was abolished in 337 by Constantine I out of respect for Jesus, who died on the cross. The crucifixion of our Lord Jesus Christ between two thieves is recorded in the New Testament by all four evangelists. Matthew 27, verses 33 to 44, Mark 15, verse 22 to 32, Luke 23, verse 33 to 45, and then John 19, verse 17 to 30. The significance of the crucifixion has been a subject for theological discussion throughout our ages of the history of the church. If Jesus hadn't died for us, we could not be gathered here today. More than likely, we would not be gathered here today with the assurance of salvation that we all have. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. God gave Jesus to be nailed to that cross for us while we were sinners. Jesus was innocent. That sacrifice that Jesus made for us, we, we uh, think about today as we partake of these emblems that we have up here, or that we all have now in our possession. These emblems are here to represent Jesus, the one who died on that cross more than 2,000 years ago, it's the Son of God himself sent to earth as a perfect sacrifice for us, as we said, while we were sinners. Without the death of Jesus, this might not be possible. Let us not give thanks for it. Let us love. Father, we, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this love that is an emblem of the body of your son, Jesus, who died for all of us more than 2,000 years ago. It's been recorded scriptures and we've been told to meet each third of uh, each uh, week on the first day of the week and to remember that death, that burial, and that resurrection. We pray that you would help us to remember the suffering and the pain that Jesus endured for our sake. We need to remember and think about the crucifixion, that cruel torture that Jesus bore. He bore it all so that we might live. Father, we pray that as we partake of this loaf that we would do so in a way that you intended when you, when the Last Supper was initiated, and that we do so in a way acceptable to you, our God and Father. In the name of your Son, Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. Amen.
Father, we thank you again for this, this fruit of the vine that represents the precious blood of Jesus, your only Son, that you gave us a way for all of us to find salvation. You sent him to earth to suffer on Calvary's cross, to endure all that pain and that suffering, and finally death, while he was blameless, without sin. We were the ones who sinned. But he gave his life for us. We ask now that you be with us as we drink this fruit of the vine. We pray that we would act and do this in a very uh, a way that you would find pleasing and in accordance with your will. We pray all this in your son Jesus' name. Amen. Sorry, Father, we often forget to say thank you for all that you do for us, and we take so much for granted, it seems, as we go through life. We pray for strength to be better Christians, to act more like Jesus in our daily lives, and to recognize and help those who are less fortunate that are in need. And as we prepare now to give, we would pray that this offering would be used to glorify you, Father, and to help build up the, the Church of Christ, your Church. We pray that we would bring more people to you by acting as true Christians and, and by following your, your words, the words in your Holy Bible. Thank you for that, Father. We pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Before Charlie's sermon this morning, we'll sing song number 598. <clears throat> Standing on the promises of Christ my King, through eternal ages let his praises ring. Glory in the highest I will shout and sing. Standing on the promises of God, standing on the promises, standing on the promises, standing on the promises of God my Savior. promises of God, standing on the promises that cannot fail, when the howling storms of doubt and fear assail, by the living word of God I shall prevail, standing on the promises of God. Promises of God, my Savior, 
Doesn't it make sense that if that's the way you would like for people to treat you, that you should do the same? For that's exactly what Jesus was saying here. It's picked up, if you will, by the different writers of the New Testament, uh, and especially the Apostle Paul uh, in, in many of his 13 books. He, he touches on this subject in one form or another. And let's, try to, uh, let's talk about, first of all, as men should do unto you. How do you want people to treat you? What is it that you hope the act would be from an individual towards you? And if you understand that, then we can go to the next set, uh, step. I thought about this all week long since I promised you the sermon last week. Proverbs chapter 15, verse 1. A soft answer turneth away wrath. Have you ever been in a conversation with someone where whether you liked it or not, it got heated? Maybe not from your vantage point. Maybe it's totally from the person that you're talking to. Have you ever noticed that if you continue to talk in a soft tone and don't raise your voice, don't back, get aggressive back with that person, eventually, eventually, it will tone itself down. And so there's, a, there's an idea there for every one of us about a soft answer turning the way around. Romans chapter 12, and this is something important enough to me that if you got to, uh, your Bible or your tablet uh, or your, your phone, whatever device that you have where you can go there with me, I really would like for you to do so with me for just a moment. I'd like for us to take a few moments and look at some very, very key verses there. Uh, because there in chapter 12, he gives us a series of of admonitions about how that we are to conduct ourselves as Christians. Uh, we hear the phrase all the time, take the high road. I think it's understood that that's the way Christians should and would conduct themselves, by taking the high road, by, by being the example of all things. Start with me, <clears throat> verse 9. Let love be without hypocrisy. I said this before, I'll probably hear, but I'll say it again. <clears throat> in the English vernacular, we have one word that we encompass everything from the depths of our feeling to our, uh, toward our mate to chocolate, okay? And that's that word love. I love dying with all my heart, but I also love chocolate, okay? Now, how could that be parallel? <laughs> How do you think Diane would feel if I used it in that kind of a context? There are four different words in the Greek language for love, and it incorporated the kind that we had for our family, the kind that we would have for brothers and sisters of Christ called the agape love. Uh, there's the, the, uh, the brotherly love, phileo, uh, Philadelphia, the, the city of brotherly love. All of those were, were, were used individually. And so in this context, he says, let love be without hypocrisy. And brethren, I tell you that I love you, and that my actions are otherwise, you've heard the expression all your life, actions speak louder than words. What is it that we demonstrate by our communication with one another? Do we convey genuine love? Is it sincere? Does that person feel that from us? And why would Paul have to say, let love be without hypocrisy? The word hypocrisy comes from the Greek word hypocrites, and it literally meant to play or to act as on a stage. Is your love playing? Is it acting? Or is it genuinely sincere? <laughs> And do we feel that both when we express it and the person that's seeing that and hearing that isn't exactly the same one? Verse 10, be devoted to one another. Devoted to one You know, I, I know you've probably seen this or heard this, experienced it before. There are preachers that will do a whole series on what they call the one another passages. And this is just one of the many. So many times in the New Testament, we're encouraged to love one another. To be gender, and you'll see it right here in this text, to be tenderly affectioned one toward another. Uh, the Ventrellas over here have a beautiful baby daughter. 
you know, when, when they pick them up, when their grandparents pick them up, when her, uh, when any of us pick her up, think about the, the, the way, the tenderness, the gentleness, the kindness that we would demonstrate toward that child. That's what God is saying is the way that we should convey our feelings one toward another. That we should have that kind of tenderness, that kind of kindness in everything that we do. Let's go a little bit further. Give preference to one another. You know what that suggests? That I would have no problem whatsoever expecting good from you if I did nothing but give good, good, give good things towards you and honor preferring one another. You know, esteem them as exceeding highly in love for their work sake. I don't care what the situation is, try to say nice things to one another. And, and like I said, it has a lot to do with what Brother Phil said today. We have gone through some really tense times the last couple of weeks in our country. And they will continue on. And it's on our thoughts and our minds and sometimes, brethren, be it the COVID virus, be it Democrats or Republicans, we have a tendency to draw a line in the sand. And if everybody doesn't agree with us completely, we have a tendency to reject them, repel them, or to be unkind to that person. Brethren, these passages says that cannot be so. And if we as Christians do not employ that kind of behavior, what's the rest of the world going to do? It's got to start right here. It's that important. So, so we, we, we have to look at that very, very carefully. Not lagging behind in diligence, fervent in spirit, serving the Lord. Rejoicing in hope, persevering in tribulation, contributing to the necessity of the saints. Sarah brought a request here today for a family that was previous members here. And the request was to help to make a donation. And I, tr I strongly support that type of request. I believe that this very much coincides Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10. And that's the verse that says, Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. And I, I want you to understand this. When this verse was written, and Galatians 6 was written, it was not about the Cherry Hill Church of Christ. It was about the Church of Christ. I'm talking about universal. Every congregation. These people, from what I, I, I didn't, I asked Sarah, she'll tell you this, I didn't even know who the Jamesons were. Okay? And she explained to me that they were previous members. Okay? They're not current members, but they're still members. Whether they be of this congregation, of yet another congregation. And this verse, as well as the one in Galatians chapter 6 and verse 10, suggests to me that it supersedes the Joliet Coke program or the New Lenox food program because these are non members. That's not to say that we don't do that, because I, and I've supported both of them. I've donated coats, I've donated food, and I believe in that, strongly believe in that. But what I'm trying to tell you is, Looking at the scripture specifically, we make special consideration for our brethren. That's what Galatians 6 says. Do good unto all men, especially those of the household of faith. The verse that we're just now looking at, contributing to the needs of the saints. We need to do it in-house first before we go beyond the house when we look at our contributions. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and curse not. Rejoice with those that rejoice. Weep with those who weep. Be in the same mind one toward another. That's just here in this particular passage. And it's just one to the church at Rome. I think of, of Philippians chapter 4, for instance, okay? And especially verse 8. Finally, brethren, what sort of things are true? What sort of things are pure? What sort of things are honest? What, what sort of things are just? Whatsoever things are wholesome, whatsoever things are of good report, if there be any virtue, if there be any praise, think on these things. God wants us to think on positive things, especially one toward another. And it's going to be this kind of behavior that will help us. 
when Peter writes, and yet another apostle, another direction, chapter 1, 2 Peter, beginning with verse 5. Finally, brethren, grow. He says this not only here, but also in chapter 3 and verse 18 of this book. Uh, giving all diligence to add to your faith, verse 5. And then he starts talking about the things that we need to add. Virtue. Could it be said, and, and, and I think about this, we, we, you know, eventually we will all pass away, and the standard in this country is to have a gravestone, tombstone, whatever you want to call it. Uh, 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 uh. And on that, that tombstone, we put something about that individual. Would, be, would virtue be one of the words to describe you? A virtuous woman for who can find for her price is far above rubies. Proverbs chapter 31 verse 10. And then it goes. That's the only two times that I remember in the whole Bible that the word virtue is used. Okay? Uh, and, and Well, actually the third one here because the one Philippians chapter 4. But those are the kinds of things that God expects for us to add to your faith virtue, to your virtue knowledge, to your knowledge templates. You know, the, the, the quality of being temperate is not limited just to the eldership. It should be limited to each and every one of us. And that is, if you will, being tolerant with one another. We're different. We're all different. We have our own feelings, our own thoughts, uh, our own experiences, our own exposure. Just had a really good uh, uh, visit with Brother Roy. He tells me that he's from Canada. And, and of course, Cindy kind of brought that to my attention just recently. But that being said, uh, I'm sure that, that he's had his own life experiences living in and out of the country several different times. Uh, and I love that. I love the fact that, that we do have, we bring to, to uh, the table different types of characters. I think Brother Holly said he's from South Dakota. I think he's the only man I've ever met in my life from South Dakota. <laughs> I, I say that somewhat jokingly. I probably have met a few that just not that, that uh, common for me, if you will. But that's what happens. We become a melting pot in the church be it southern or northern, eastern, wherever it is, another country. And God acknowledges all as being the same. And he wants us all to grow the same and do the same. I wrote down for my closing remarks a third point, and I want you to think about that. What we don't want when we talk about how that we treat others, we don't want people uh, uh, criticizing us unjustly. Uh, we don't want people talking down to us, condescending in any way. We do want kind people. Every one of us want that. Uh, and we don't want to interface any more than is necessary with people who are not Christ-like. Think about this lesson. Think about the verse itself. And if in any way you might be subject to Christ's invitation, come while we go to stand on this.